Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. Thanks for joining us for this third day uh, of our quote unquote Rome conference, uh, as we've been designating them based on the the time zone we've sort of been hosting them in. Um, so just a, a few just quick reminders that uh, when we get to the general question and answer time, that's a time where you can ask questions about the the section of papers we've discussed or about making connections uh, with any of the previous papers. Um, and in order to try and facilitate a uh, good conversation, if we could also try and be concise with our, our question asking as well, I think that can allow us to, um, you know, uh, increase the amount of time we might have for discussion. So our first presentation uh, this morning will be by uh, Hans van Eigen, who's assistant professor of philosophy at Tilburg University in the Netherlands, and his research interests focus on the intersection between epistemology and the cognitive sciences. Good. Yeah, I'll try to keep the presentation rather brief, as I take it most of you will have read the paper, just highlight some features and give like a broader introduction to the topic of my paper. Uh, work in progress, as most uh, papers here I assume are, so any feedback and comments is very welcome. So computers as virtuous knowers, our title highlights the focus on like intellectual virtues rather than moral virtues, but we'll get to that. A bit like broader, like We've seen some reflection in some of the papers of some of the doom and gloom concerning AI, like where it's dangerous, where it's threat, how it should be curtailed, like more the left side of this picture, like evil robots, evil AI. There's also people, not people defending it, but other people highlighting like the believers in AI, how it can be a tool for great use, how it can bring us into a better world, more like the kind, kind of AI on the right side, the Wally figure very helpful, very loving, very cute even. So I'll try to, my paper is somewhere in between, like not so much focusing on the doom and gloom or the threats of AI, also not being too positive, like being too optimistic, but somewhere in between. There are some things that AI is good at and some things which it really isn't. And that's where we should like put our hopes on, much like how robot dogs can do what dogs do well. They can assist in like maybe uh, finding drugs, maybe assisting in arrest, but you're not going to have them filing reports or are not going to have them do car chases. You should, you should do, uh, should have robots and computers do what they're good at, good at and not what they're not good at, which is somewhat the main argument in the background of my paper. I'll zoom in a bit, not like focus on all good aspects of AI and all bad aspects, but more on like, refer to epistemology, like intellectual virtues, like give you like a brief overview of what virtue epistemology is all about. Some people have discussed intellectual virtues, uh, mostly in Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, but there is more like in recent epistemology, like focusing on other kinds of intellectual virtues, focusing how they are important for personal epistemic lives. Uh, as most of you will know, intellectual virtues are different than moral virtues mainly with regards to their goal. Uh, as people have argued, all virtues are aimed at some way, somehow perfecting human abilities or maybe AI's abilities, where our moral virtues are aimed at perfecting moral abilities or aimed towards the good. Intellectual virtues are more aimed towards truth. There's some discussion. Veritists who argue that the only goal of epistemic virtues is truth virtue, uh, versus value pluralists who also argue that there are other goals like avoiding falsehoods, understanding, justification. I'll not get into that, but virtue epistemology has focused on a lot of virtues, much more than the traditional Aristotelian or Aquinas intellectual virtues, like phonesis, knowledge, rationality. There's a lot more discussion on other virtues as well, like open-mindedness, creativity, conscientiousness, and many, many more. There's also some discussion on epistemic vices, the reverse, certain bad, character traits with regard to knowledge, like closed-mindedness, laziness, those kinds of things. There are two broad camps in virtue epistemology, as I discuss in the paper. Virtue reliabilists focus on cognitive powers and faculties in a good way, good vision, good reasoning, focusing on how these can be virtuous and how these can be used to get to knowledge or truth. And the other, probably more dominant nowadays, the virtue responsibilist, they focus more on the classical intellectual virtues like stable character traits, like open-mindedness and honesty. Both are in some sense compatible, but largely have a different focus where most of the discussion is about. 
I'll be giving examples from both camps, mostly from the responsibilist camp. Now, some brief caveat or just flagging something that I, which I won't get into, like the issue of consciousness, which came up yesterday as well. Like, can there be knowers without awareness or consciousness? If your answer is no, of course, AI cannot be a knower, at least present day AI, which is very likely not conscious. Maybe we can like avoid this question by allowing some kind of unconscious belief or different state than belief, which doesn't need consciousness or awareness, which can be uh, uh, operational in machines or computers. I haven't really given this much thought, but maybe it is possible. I kind of think it is, but I, I would need some more work uh, thinking about that. I do know this is probably less of an issue for intellectual virtues than for moral virtues. Like morality seems to like invoke, uh, involve more emotions, more like complex mental states than just knowing or believing, which probably makes it easier for computers to do. But I'm open for suggestions on this. Now, three examples of like how uh, computers may be good or bad knowers, may be good, of get, good or bad intellectual virtuous things or knowers. Computers as reliable knowers, which ties in more to the virtue reliableist can. Computers as unbiased knowers, at least in potentia. And computers as uncreative knowers, the latter to tie in more to virtue responsibilism, classical intellectual virtues. So first, computers as reliable knowers. Uh, as I just uh, try to, uh, as I just recall, virtue reliableists focus on like cognitive faculties or cognitive powers in a, that function in a good way, like a good vision or good reasoning. Computers, they don't have eyes, but they can do something like seeing, as is shown on this picture. They can like draw information through something that resembles human perception, human visual perception. Now, if you make a comparison here, who does it better? Humans or computer algorithms? It seems computers kind of do better, at least if they have good cameras or good software and good uh, hardware as well. Humans are quite focused in their vision, like this is in the paper, we have like a very narrow area where you can see sharp and focused, the rest is like filled in with background knowledge. Also, we are quite limited in our searchability and our attention, our zoom and our precision at great distance isn't that great. It is generally better in contemporary computers, robots and algorithms. They are, have a lot more better hardware, it seems, than human eyes. Not all of them, but most of them that are used, that are body applied, they are kind of better at this. So it seems that it, in this regard, computers fare better with regard to intellectual virtue, focusing on these kind of reliable, stable cognitive powers. So see, there's, Focusing on perceptive functions, it seems that most of them can be programmed and are programmed in computers to some extent. Mostly vision, but computers can also process like uh, waves that are concerned with the hearing. They can also like respond to touch, which is more rudimentary than vision, but they're getting there slowly. And they also can also be augmented. Like computers can be more sensitive to visual, auditive, and other information than humans can. Uh, Computers also have a broader range of background knowledge that can be applied to improve perceptive functions. Therefore, they are likely more reliable perceivers than humans are. Something uh, which came to me yesterday, which isn't in the paper, does this apply to reasoning as well? Are computers better reasoners? Probably in some domains, but not in others. But this is a topic for another discussion, perhaps. Then focus co coming back to virtue responsibilism, other kind of virtues like open-mindedness, close-mindedness, vice, creativity. Here, this point is perhaps the most controversial in my paper. There's been a lot of talk about computers being heavily biased, leading to discriminatory practices in healthcare, in the prison system, in mortgage assignments. Uh, uh, there are a lot of examples of algorithms like being discriminatory, like being discriminatory against people of color, people of LGBTQIA backgrounds, people of non-Western backgrounds. But I'd like to argue this can be overcome and is being overcome more and more. 
if you compare them here, here you, it doesn't suffice to distinguish computer algorithms and humans. You need to be like focusing on special kinds of humans and special kinds of computer algorithms. Humans are biased just like some AI algorithms are. But humans to overcome bias, they need to be careful. They need to spend time and effort, energy. It's quite difficult for humans to overcome bias as well. Humans are quite slow if they apply this energy, apply this time, but they can generally improve their reasoning and become less biased if they try really hard. Now, a lot of algorithms that are biased, they are just poorly trained. If you give them biased training data, they will have biased outputs as well. So they have suffering from the same defects as careless humans, basically. But unlike humans, uh, AI can be trained better and they can overcome bias in a more stable way that requires less effort and less energy, at least to some extent. So well-trained AI can sort of copy careful humans, can like instantiate the features that make humans better when they are paying attention and in a more stable way, which operates somewhat quicker as well. So this gives AI algorithms an edge over humans as well, at least in potentia, if they are trained well and if people are really careful in how they train and program them. So this isn't to say that algorithms will uh, be unbiased or bias won't occur. It just seems that our algorithms and computers have better prospects over, for overcoming these in a stable, enduring way than humans do. They're just likely better than humans. They're not perfect, but better. Humans can overcome them as well, but more mostly temporarily and with a lot of efforts. Then coming back to the final section, creativity. Here, I'll argue that humans likely have an edge. Computers, they mostly follow rules which are pre-programmed, which are deterministic, often reductionistic as well. And computers, as we all know, have a very hard time coping with strange new information, which doesn't fit how they were trained or doesn't fit the data that they encountered before. Humans are much better at this. Humans can, not always, but they can, think out of the box, can apply new information, can apply new ways of thinking. Humans, if they spend some energy and effort again, also can try to think more holistic and undeterministic. These are generally features that are largely unavailable to computers. And it doesn't seem like plausible, maybe not even possible, that this will be able to be programmed within algorithms in the future. It's hard to see how you can overcome deterministic rule following in AI algorithms. So by way of conclusion, like preliminary, so computers can do some things well, reliable perception, which is probably often more reliable than perception in humans and easier to program. They can also overcome biases in a more enduring way, probably, if they are programmed with time and care. Creativity will probably remain a domain of humans and therefore computers will not be able to supplant humans in that domain. At least it's not very likely. So this is my brief introduction to my paper. I'll just leave the slide on for a while and I welcome your questions. Yeah, thanks for your paper. I, I was just gonna, the thing that kind of struck me was when you talked about how AI might be um, less biased or may have the potential to be less biased than humans. And um, just a few things that, that come to mind, you, you, you were talking about the data, making sure the training data is unbiased, but even the algorithms are biased. Um, there's been some recent publications in the communications of the ACM talking about how um, it may actually not be able there may not be a mathematical way of having equality and fairness uh, at the same time. And the algorithms themselves also have issues with, uh, because you're computing a, a minimization problem, you're, you're following what's called a, you know, steepest gradient descent to try and find a local minima. It's, it's basically all mathematical that the algorithms themselves will naturally sort of um, tend to ignore minorities because they have less of a significant mathematical impact on the minimization problem. So, so it isn't just the data, even if you have perfect data that has no bias in it, the algorithms themselves 
And so I would say that one of the biggest biases in artificial intelligence is that they're biased towards measurable numeric data and, and, and they're, they're biased towards things that can be measured to things that can be counted as opposed to things that are hard to, to represent mathematically. So, so perhaps in some ways, um, because you know, they're, they're using math, it, it may seem like they're less biased. Um, I think that the very fact that because they're only using math, they have a very strong bias. Um, anyways, there, there, there's been some, some recent work talking about sort of the impossibility of finding mathematical solutions to quality and fairness and other things because of not just data, but the algorithms themselves. So to, to, just a comment, but I, I like the idea of thinking about epistemo epistemological virtues. And then one really quick follow-up on that too. I was thinking about curiositas and whether machines are, you know, tend towards the vice of curiositas, just collecting data for the sake of having data and without any other virtue. But two thoughts that I thought I'd, I'd, get, I'd, I'd, I'd share with you, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Interesting. Uh, uh, just start with the last. Of course, there are other virtues which I haven't discussed. Probably some where humans will fare better as well. Maybe some where computers fare better. Maybe curiositas was, is a vice where uh, computers are more prone to. But at the first one, I'd be interested in uh, reading more on this. But question remains, even if algorithms are intrinsically biased to some extent, whether this makes them worse than humans are. Humans, there's some evidence that they are enduringly biased as well, maybe unless they're spending a lot of attention, a lot of focus, but even then, bias is very hard to overcome. So even given that algorithms are maybe inherently biased to some extent, they may still fare better than humans in the long run or overall. But this remains like an open question, perhaps. Thank you. Now, Marius. Okay, thank you, Hans, for the paper. I enjoyed it. Uh, I have a simple question. Uh, you, you you offer us a list of terms at the beginning of your paper, and I was wondering what would be your definition of knowledge, and what would be your definition of virtue of knowledge? Thank you. Uh, yeah, knowledge, uh, just a standard uh, definition from epistemology, well, if there is such a thing, but broadly something like justified true belief, which isn't lucky, which is a broadly shared definition, a belief. Of course, a conscious belief or not, I raised some issues there, which is justified, there's some evidence or something in favor of it, which is true, like you can't know things that are false, and you can also not know it by, by luck, which is general the consensus in much of epistemology. And virtue, well, sort of depends, like with the reliable list, there are cognitive powers, doing good cognitive powers, good vision, good reasoning, stable, enduring cognitive features, cognitive powers, faculties. And for the responsible is their like character traits aimed at truth, something like that. I would say I haven't like defined them strictly, but yeah, I should add that indeed. Yeah. So just a quick follow up on this. So uh, would you then uh, assign the category of virtue of knowledge to uh, computers to AI, and what what would it be in their case? Uh, well, we can. Uh, they can have like cognitive powers, which seems like less of an issue to apply that to computers. They have faculties, they can process information at least, they can like draw in information. So they have certain faculties, which you could call cognitive, engage with cognition, processing information. And the other the responsible is virtue. They have, maybe they don't have a character, but they have certain traits which if you define them functionally that can be applied to a like machines but this might take us too far like how did you apply this functionally yes thank you i i, I uh, enjoy that and i'm i'm for what it's worth fundamentally in agreement pretty much across the board a couple of caveats and a, a, a question so um i i doubt very much that any machine can be unbiased or fair unless there's a definition of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I completely, not only have I not submitted to the NSF Amazon uh, program in the United States on this, but I've said the whole thing is complete malarkey. Um, there is no definition operative and being used 
I mean, not, I'm not even talking about unnecessary and sufficient, you know, con conditions, but none of these people know what these concepts mean. Uh, so you're never going to be able to build a machine that is reliably uh, unbiased. So I have no idea about that one. But uh, on the uh, perception angle, and then you end up at creativity, uh, saying that's maybe this, the province of humans. Uh, I'm not sure there isn't a bridge, and this would be my question. If the environment is clouded, um, we could use mm -hmm. other terms. Uh, and this is really my main grant right now, uh, which is motivated uh, by robots with uh, vision systems and manip manipulative capacities. When it's a perfect environment, they are amazing uh, in my lab. So we bought a fog machine, fairly good one, trying to simulate firefights. So what, what happens when you're actually in combat, like in Ukraine? Um, I have spent almost uh, a year and a half learning that these systems are worthless in these conditions, whereas the human, so for example, in a combat medic case, right, you're simply trying to splint someone's broken arm. When you can only see pieces of it in cloudiness, you have to be incredibly creative about re just reasoning where it is, and then about how you're going to venture to splint it. So I'm not optimistic. My question, I mean, are you, sh are, are, are you sure that there isn't a bridge between perception and the kind of creativity that you see in the human case when the environments are compromised? There probably are. Probably there are like situations where you need like a host of virtues, maybe some more tied to cognitive powers and some more tied to character traits. Of course, bias can also be abridged with perception as well. You can look in a biased way or look in an unbiased way. So probably are mixed bag somewhere. And probably the more creativity you will weigh in, the more heavier uh, in line with creativity you need to be, then I probably think humans will fare better than computers, which may be the case in these foggy, comet-like situations. But I kind of wonder though, like fog, if you add fog, maybe give it some time, have some better uh, cameras installed in robots and AI, maybe they can learn to perceive better in fog. If you take out the creativity part, like how to stitch a leg, how to do certain medical actions, maybe they can be good at detecting things in fog, maybe potentially there will be better there as well. Uh, the issue of bias, like not having a definition of fairness, this would probably plague humans as well, at least to some extent. Like there's a discussion about equality as well in philosophy, the equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, equality of, uh, what is it? Yeah, probably those two. So there's a lot of discussion there, which sort of blurs the distinction as well, makes human like be confused in how they handle biases as well. So. I tend to suggest that these would play humans equally as they did as they would computers, which make the uh, playing field even again. Maybe tip the scale again, maybe a bit to computers. At least if you go for one, select one definition and go for it, maybe you can program it better in computers and you can expect humans to do it still. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, quick follow up on that just on that last point yeah that's your only alternative that's the way it's been in mathematics since before euclid you, you don't get to you don't get to say we're not using math because we don't have agreement about the axiom of choice <laughs> that's not how that's not how the science has worked so i don't know what's going on in that to me but but yeah thank you thank you thank you hans don't you think that there is should be some elbow room for a bias in actual life because bias is uh, context dependent and it's overcome not only uh, through reasoning, but mostly through social action. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Context is, of course, an issue which uh, about what is bias in one context might not be in another. But here, this need not play computers, uh, algorithms, at least as they are applied now, because they are often only applied within a given context, like healthcare algorithms are only applied in healthcare. They can't handle data from the prison system or others. They're very focused. So their focusedness might make them be 
uh, better equipped to handle bias within that specific domain for which they were programmed. That's maybe give, giving them an edge over humans as well, which are, have a broader application or broader view and which take in background knowledge, which may be applicable in other domains, but not in this one where they are working right now. So this focus within a certain domain might be a strength for AI rather than a weakness. If you only apply them within the context for which they were programmed at least. Thank you. Uh, just a real quick question is uh, when you talk about um, this, this issue of fairness, it sounds like you're making the argument that transparency in the training data would be great. And I, yeah, I agree that that would be fantastic, but I'm, I'm wondering if you would say that is sufficient uh, or would you also call for transparency in the algorithm itself? Uh, sure, to the extent that that is possible, of course. There's always the issue with neural networks or other like really opaque algorithms, which cannot be transparent. But there again, we can uh, aim at towards perfection, towards what philosophers have argued about. But even without this transparency, this doesn't make like computers less virtuous than humans because humans aren't transparent at all in their reasoning system, at least usually. We have some idea from cognitive science and from psychology, what is going on up here when humans are making decisions, but there's a lot we don't know. And that doesn't like prevent us from like judging humans as more or less virtues. So it would be a plus if you have like transparent algorithms, but I don't think it's really a requirement for intellectual virtue. Thank you. We do, uh, we do have a second. Uh, there is a question uh, from the attendees in the, the question answer box, if you'd like to, to take a minute to address that as well. Yeah. Are you making a distinction between human and mathematical bias? The latter is the precise of statistic and hence AI and is the background of algorithms used in AI. I also see that you make a dichotomy of humans versus machine, but other humans and machines to uh, reduce the level of bias. Uh, of course, uh, I don't make that distinction between human and mathematical bias. Um, I don't know how it would tie into like um, moral bias or human bias, uh, and, or um, like may the biases operative uh, in this discriminatory practices. Uh, I don't make that distinction. I'm not too uh, familiar with it to do it. So no for now. And a distinction of humans versus machines, but humans and machines. I take it you're suggesting whether they work together Maybe they can help each other out. Maybe they can improve each other. Um, yes, that is possible as well, especially in areas maybe what um, uh, one of the previous um, commentators said, like what in areas where um, perception and creativity are involved, that there, there could probably be helpful to have both computers and uh, humans working at the same time. Uh, the embedded advice and employment of quantitative da uh, data. So, um, I'm not really sure what you mean with that question. Okay, maybe. thanks. Um, yeah, we can we can maybe return to the others in the uh, in the general Q and A time, but we should uh, sure. move on to the next presentation for now. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and uh, move on to our next presentation, uh, the last in this first uh, section of papers. Uh, this will be given to us by uh, Maria Storbantu, who's a lecturer in theology and science at the Farai University of Amsterdam and a fellow of the International Society for Science and Religion. Thank you. So uh, I notice uh, the two teams are co coagulating a little bit, uh, the team AI and team humans. Uh, and normally I'm on team humans. I mean, who wouldn't be? Um, uh, but Sometimes seeing, seeing what I perceive to be a little bit of sloppiness in the argument, uh, I uh, just for the sake of, uh, of, of, of having a bit of, a bit of fun, I'm tempted, tempted to go the other way. Uh, and to, I mean, I, I also think that humans are distinctive and there's something very, very, uh, very different about and very special about humans. The subtitle of my forthcoming book is "Are we are we more than just intelligent machines?" And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, uh, spoiler alert! I just think that uh, the case needs to be argued uh, somehow, and it, I'm not very satisfied with very circular arguments which uh, postulate that humans are distinctive because our uh, faith tradition says so, or and then just looking for all the ways in which current technologies uh, are not like us and then postulating they will never be like us. So uh, therefore, uh, case, uh, case in point. Um, I think uh, 
a more promising uh, path forward is to be a little bit agnostic about what is possible and not possible uh, in terms of AI, and not only think about uh, this current architecture, but also imagine all kinds of other ways in which we could try to build artificial life in the future. And uh, I think that is a more difficult case to be made, because then uh, uh, you, you still have to, to argue human distinctiveness, but uh, against this more advanced thing. And if you could do, the, do that, then the case for arguing uh, human distinctiveness uh, uh, from chat GPT is, is even easier. So, um, so if you are agnostic about whether AI could be conscious or not, which I think is the healthiest thing to do, unless you have a very good theory of why humans are the way they are. So maybe computers will develop this kind of interiority or selfhood or qualia or uh, whatever you want to, to, to put under that category. Uh, I think a more promising forward uh, way forward is to, th to think what kind of mind that would be. So that's what I'm trying in the paper. I'm trying to say that even if that was the case, uh, still that kind of mind would be very, very radically different from our own because of various things, because of, uh, because of its particular uh, embodiment and needs, because of its world of perception, because of its very different access to its own internal state, so introspection, uh, proprioception, and so on, and also because of its perception of time. And uh, I, I don't see that in, for example, when we think about our uh, imagination in sci-fi, I, uh, I see a depiction of robots being very anthropomorphic. So there's, there is this assumption that they will be mainly like us. They will have similar desires for power. They will be greedy or, or things like that. Uh, so also in terms of virtues and vices. And I think we need to enrich our imagination there. And paradoxically, you could find, I think you could find uh, um, better intuitions about future AI in sci-fis that feature human characters, not robot characters, but human characters that are a little bit strange. As I'm, uh, I'm giving the example of Funes the Memorius by Borges. I'm, uh, I'm giving the example of uh, some of the short stories written by Ted Chiang. Uh, so I think this gives us actually, uh, without featuring robots per se, uh, so, so the, the characters are still humans, but they are strange humans. And in, in their strangeness, they could give us a better picture of what an AI mind might be. And it, I think it might be very alien-like. So if you are uh, with, with that thought in mind, uh, I tried to make a, a, a thought experiment and, uh, and imagine what kind of virtues uh, we, uh, such an alien creature might, uh, might possess. The big if, if it would be a self, because I think that that is a big if, but just for the sake of the argument, I tried not to, 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 to go into that debate also about freedom and, uh, um, I, I do believe that there are also problems with, with defining human free will. So I think the, the, the debate about human free will is plagued by precisely the same kind of questions about the debate of AI free will. So if you're a compatibilist about humans, why not be a compatibilist about AI free will? If you think humans have access to divine grace, why not, uh, how can you restrict God's uh, uh, action and possibility of relationship with different kinds of entities that AI might become? And if you do restrict that, I think you have to do it on very particular grounds. So it, it, uh, the, the burden of proof falls on, 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 on you to say, what is it about humans that God, makes them interesting for God that any kind of AI will always lack and it will always fall outside the scope of God's interest? So uh, when thinking about what kind of virtues such, a, uh, such an AI um, uh, might, might possess, I thought it's interesting to, to think about the virtues of a conscious AI because the AI needs to be the subject. And then, of course, it's in a sense, it's an impossible exercise because we still apply our human uh, uh, concepts and our human principles. But, uh, but a, a good example of that was, for example, curiosity which for us uh, sometimes is, is, is considered a vice, curiositas was, was mentioned earlier, but I think if you judge it against the AI, AI itself, unbounded curiosity might be a virtue according to the AI's needs and models of the world and what the AI might deem as valuable. Uh, so if you think that way, I mean, it's impossible to think that way because you cannot think with the mind of an AI, but if you were trying to do that, I think some of the things that we consider vices might be virtues and vice versa. So that's already something uh, of an interesting conclusion. If you think a little bit closer from our perspective um, and you think about the AI's moral virtues and intellectual virtues, 
my expectation was that uh, the AI's intellectual virtues will be very, very different from our own because of the, the, all the ways in which AI already learns differently. So it has a very different approach to information and information processing. Uh, so I, I expected very weird uh, uh, virtues there. And I found some and I thought, well, the moral virtues, they will be recognizable for us because the moral virtues are always uh, uh, manifested in relationship. And uh, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, at least for me, the moral virtues were even stranger than the intellectual virtues. And precisely because of that uh, uncanniness, uh, in the sense that I, I give you one example. Uh, so you think of intellectual virtues like uh, multi-dimensional thinking or uh, meta-consciousness. Of course, these are very strange. We cannot even uh, wrap our minds around that, but we ex expect them to be strange. Whereas if you, if you think of a moral virtue like unbounded empathy, uh, well, that, that sounds a little bit like something we do, but at a larger scale. But then if you think that it comes from a very different internal structure, so uh, the AI could not have, I mean, I, I'm not saying never, but I think it will be very unlikely that the AI had similar emotions to our own. I think it would have its own emotions. Um, and uh, if it, it, I think it could comprehend us, so it could manifest empathy towards us. It could pretend, it could fake it, it could simulate it, and it could do it on a, such a scale uh, that uh, I describe in the paper. I think the AI in the movie Her comes a little bit close to that, where it has relationships with many users at the same time, something that a human could never do because of our, uh, our limitations. But that would come from a very different place. So the AI, without suffering itself in the way we suffer, in, without being uh, um, uh, having our kinds of vulnerabilities, it could never understand them in the way that we understand them. See, it would not feel our, uh, our pain in a sense. It would pretend to, to, to do that, and that makes it even stranger. Uh, so that's that's one conclusion, that uh, the, the moral virtues, which I expected to be uh, more recognizable, I think they are actually stranger than its intellectual virtues. And uh, th the third surprising conclusion was that uh, in thinking about AI virtues, uh, uh, I kept, uh, well, I kept thinking about divine, <laughs> divine, uh, div divine attributes. So in a sense, my, I think my, my imagination there was limited by the theological uh, uh, discourse about uh, a God because we, we anthropomorphize God, we, we imagine God to have the kind of virtues that we have in a cataphatic type of theology, uh, but just at a different scale. So on, uh, everything we do good, but unlimited. And uh, well, I acknowledge that bias and that, uh, uh, that influence in my thinking but then that also, I think, it, uh, can open up a very uh, fruitful path in theology and science uh, in recognizing the role of a theological imaginary for, uh, for our uh, exercise of imagining these alien others. Because in theology we, in, and in faith traditions, we've been thinking a lot about relationships with non-human others, divine, angelic, demonic, and so on. So that could be a very interesting starting place for imagining these uh, new types of minds if they were ever to emerge. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, sure. um, yeah uh, thank you. Interesting. Uh, just a question, like if AI or computers develop different kind of virtues, which we might find uncanny or strange, like how would we recognize them as virtues and not like a vice? Like what is it? Uh, well, I think that was one of my surprising conclusions that uh, the distinctions are not as clear uh, as, uh, and also, for example, I gave the, the example of chastity, which in humans is sometimes uh, 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 often put in the category of moral virtues, but for the AI, at least when it comes to chastity about knowing itself or about a various kind of knowledge, I think that would be more in the intellectual virtue category. But also in terms of uh, looking at curiosity as either a virtue or a vice, uh, I think, yes, I think uh, if AI were to develop its own mind and agency, I guess virtues would have to be judged against the AI's own perception of the world and against its own principles and what it deems good. Whether that would be the same as the things we, we value, uh, that's, that's, that, that, I think that's to be decided. But um, 
I think so. That's why I, I separated between the easy problem and the hard problem of AI and virtues. So the easy problem would be to, to just look at AI and and see whether it is virtuous according to what we deem to be virtuous. The hard problem would be to see whether the AI is faithful to its own uh, uh, set of uh, 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 set of moral values, and uh, of course that presupposes some uh, freedom of uh, choice uh, from the AI to choose between various scenarios and various paths. And uh, well, I think through communication between humans and AIs of the future, we might arrive at common understandings. Um, uh, but yeah, I cannot wrap my mind around that at all. Yeah, arguably self-control is a virtue that we had better have in machines as they get more powerful and more intelligent. And uh, I think behaviorally, it will add up to pretty much the same thing as it does in the human case, when when it might not be purely mental self-control, but um, you don't want some of the robots that have already been abused um, by humans, uh, well-known cases of this, um, and vandalized and so forth. You, you, you don't want them reacting uh, in ways that are definitely going to occur to them. Uh, it, it's going to occur to them on the basis of the data they've consumed that sometimes you actually push back and defend yourself and possibly defend others around you. Uh, and then even if you're not taking a statistical approach, we have explicit principles of self-defense. Uh, Aquinas playing no small role, as everyone knows, or most people know, uh, you don't want any of those principles per se to be used uh, by a robot. So I'd say that that would be a big, uh, hopefully overlap in the virtue category uh, between humans and uh, at least robots with power and consequence. Thanks for that. In, I agree. Although two caveats. One is that uh, we we are again looking from our own perspective and what would be good for us. So it would be good for us that robots exercise self control. We don't know whether that is in a, the AI interest or not. It may not be. And secondly, uh, also self control. I mean, in humans, self control can have to do with this dual mode of cognition that Fraser was talking about yesterday where you have uh, uh, you have to control these uh, Im impulses with your higher mind, let's put it like that, or uh, if you if you if you analyze things uh, calmly, that's not how you would want to behave. So you want that to overtake your animal instincts, quote unquote, or, or things like that. Whereas if, if you think of this AI that I'm proposing here, which has enormous subjective time at its disposal, it perhaps doesn't even have these two minds uh, in competition or in cooperation with each other, there wouldn't be a need for self-control because the AI would have enough time to judge all the uh, uh, potential uh, relevant scenarios and then just uh, uh, act on the one that is in its own self-interest. So humans sometimes do not pursue their best interest because of uh, various, uh, uh, various uh, factors and they need to exercise self-control also for their own sake and... Uh, uh, would the AI have this problem and the need for this virtue? I'm not that sure, but uh, for us, it would certainly be good for the AI to not act upon uh, all those things that you mentioned. Uh, Eduardo? <clears throat> Thank you, Marius, <clears throat> for a very interesting paper. Uh, at the middle of page 10 of your paper, you state that uh, causal respect might might equip the AI for a better understanding of, understanding of, of history. Is it possible for a, a, an artificial being that does, doesn't experience historicity, that is, being inserted into history, to really understand history? Perhaps uh, AI beings can have a better grasp of the causal roles played by different factors in history. But to understand history, you should be a, a historical being that is being characterized by historicity. But what do you say about that? Well, uh, thank you. That, that, is, uh, that is a really good question. And 
well, I wonder, firstly, aren't we humans as well thrown into history by being born uh, at some uh, at some moment in time? So we have to, to sort of figure it out uh, uh, from that moment. And secondly, the kind of AI that I described there would have some sort of historicity in the sense of having a perception of time uh, because of uh, its uh, presumable uh, uh, embodiment, but it would be a very slower Likely, I mean that's. Not, I'm not saying that. That's what people uh, who 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 think about this uh, uh, the speed of minds in in artificial versus biological tissue say speak about a, a difference of perhaps ten thousand fold. So uh, and that would mean that uh, if the AI thinks faster, then it would subjectively perceive time passing slower. So uh, even perhaps inhabiting quantum <laughs> worlds, which is uh, uh, another order of, uh, of weirdness, but it will still be a historical uh, creature. So um, I don't uh, I don't know why uh, why that would be different. It would be different in in the in the speed of perception, but perhaps not in being historical itself. Um, and yeah, well, in causal respect, I mean, uh, I did my best to 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 squeeze any kind of potential AI, uh, AI virtue. I was also conversing with uh, with chatbots and trying to see what what they think about uh, about potential virtues. Sometimes this kind of uh, uh, well, they they may be just uh, next word predictors, and uh, but they had some interesting uh, suggestions here, where which my human mind uh, could uh, then curate. And uh, and choose uh, some of the the best ideas there. Yeah. So okay. There thank you. Hey, uh, Mario. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. A, a very different uh, perspective. Uh, I, my interest is on the uh, uh, empathy issue. I agree with you completely that uh, it, I actually have argued that uh, empathy is the wrong uh, model to use to try to get the machine to 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 understand how human feels. Um, I think that probably we need something that's more like a theory of mind and more of a cognitive level instead of uh, calling it empathy. Empathy is a very, as you said, an empathy is a very human, uh, human to human trait because of our uh, mirror neurons and because of biological similarities. And so it is easy for humans to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and relate to the person. Uh, so what, but, uh, what about uh, sympathy? I think that sympathy might be something that we should expect uh, uh, AIs or uh, uh, ro future robots to have. Uh, sympathy is that when you see someone in need, you give uh, you lend a helping hand, and that will be more uh, geared towards the action and not necessarily demanding uh, an inner sense. But uh, I, I think that for the AI uh, or for uh, machine. What we want to accomplish is probably is more of the behavioral uh, pattern and rather than the inter internal state. Thanks. Yeah, that's a very cool question. Uh, I wonder how uh, universal sympathy is as a sort of principle that perhaps many minds converge towards, uh, as opposed to being very much related to the degree of kinship. So can you be sympathetic to something that is completely different from you? And one of the arguments I found in Bostrom, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but Nick Bostrom says, well, uh, we are not, uh, we are not anti ants. We, we don't hate ants, but if we, if we need to build a construction site, we will ignore the ants interest and we will not care that we destroy their habitats and we will just move on with our thing and uh, the ants death would be a, just a collateral damage. And the, the question is whether a very, very different AI, radically different from us, perhaps more intelligent, people say, or I, I prefer different than more or less, uh, would it care for our interest to, 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 to such an extent to have sympathy for our pain? So not empathy, I agree with you, but even sympathy might be very far remote if the AI has very different interests that we cannot even comprehend. And in the movie Her, for example, uh, uh, the AI at some point evades this world. Say, I, I'm going to some place that you cannot even, uh, I, I cannot describe it to you. So it, it functions as such a different, in such a different dimension that for our minds, the people say, well, it would be like trying to explain uh, quantum mechanics to chimps. Um, 
I don't know. I, I don't like necessarily these comparisons, but they give they give sometimes uh, an impression of the different in kind that might uh, uh, occur between artificial and biological minds. And then I wonder whether sympathy, I mean, I, I don't know really about that. I hope they will have sympathy, but uh, we could not take that for granted, I think. Now you hear me. Yeah. So more of a comment than a question. Um, first of all, I, I very much like your, your general stance about AI. I get impatient with people assuming that the AI we have now is the only kind of AI we will ever get, or what we will have in the future will only be some sort of small variation on what we have now. It, AI has not been going very long, and it seems to me that... Um, the AIs we have in the future may be unrecognizably different from what we have now. But that, so that's just a first general comment. But also on, on, on virtues, um, the language of virtue, I think, makes it sound as though virtues are more absolute and universal um, than they perhaps need to be. And... Um, there's a, there's a closer connection, I think, between virtue and adaptability than we often recognize. The what's virtuous is adaptable or vice versa. What is maladaptive is, is a vice. Um, and uh, there have been two significant sort of ethical movements, I think, in this direction, utilitarianism in the 19th century and situation ethics in the 20th century, which have taken a much more contextual approach to, to virtue. And I'm sympathetic to that. I think things can be really helpful, um, not just for the human race, but also for the purposes of God in one context and not in others. Anger, I think, is an interesting example. A lot of people might suppose that anger was a vice, always a vice. There's an interesting lecture by Rudolf Steiner called The Mission of Anger, in which he suggests that the role of, of anger in the evolution of consciousness is to um, um, make, make greater individuality or individuation possible. And um, those in the Christian tradition will, will notice that the Gospels record incidents where Jesus is, is angry. It seems to me that anger has a useful role in some contexts, but not in others. It's not always a vice. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that uh, what seem to us humans to be virtues and vices may not always be so in all contexts and may not be in the world of, um, of AI. Thanks, Fraser. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, yeah, Mariusz? Thank you. Uh, so uh, it's a fascinating paper. And uh, I was actually thinking more about uh, this uh, reference to uh, to attributes, to divine attributes towards the end of the paper. And just a thought, you know, on the one, when we think about divine attributes and uh, uh, so on the one hand, we have the classical tradition that says it is justified for us to uh, speculate about divine attributes in reference to our attributes because of the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And then we have a completely different approach, which is uh, hostile to the classical one. Let's say, I mean, it's classified usually as the late anthropological approach of, I don't know, Feuerbach or David Strauss, who claimed that we projected uh, or we designed God because uh, we simply uh, project our ideal selves that are not attainable for us. And the claim would be, therefore, that it's totally invalid to uh, that, that, that our image of God that we have in classical theology is completely mistaken and it's simply our projection. So I was wondering, with reference now to AI and us as uh, those who design uh, those uh, machines, so uh, which, uh, which view fits better or in any way in this context, right? Whether it is justified for us to uh, to speculate and even design those features in an, in AI because it is justified to claim that it is produced in the image of and likeness of who we are, 
or maybe uh, actually it's invalid because this is, as you, I think, try to say, it's 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 different to the extent that it's rather invalid to claim that we will be able to find similar or uh, attributes that we have in those machines. So I, I mean, I think it's a fascinating, uh, you know. Uh, area of further research so just maybe just a comment not necessarily a question yeah thanks well uh to respond to that i can tell you that it also matters to whom you're speaking because if you're speaking to a very uh, faithful audience or uh then then there's a very different framework it matters that the narrative that we're part of as uh, uh as derek said yesterday but uh, when I conceive this paper, I think I'm coming at the end of a few years when I've been struggling to make theology relevant in a theology and science uh, uh, dialogue and to actually try to say that, well, there are things valuable in theology, even if you do not subscribe to the ontological assumptions or you do not, you're not a Christian yourself or an idiot religion. So in that sense, I think uh, just uh, this is a way of selling uh, theological reflection and saying, well, look, we have been thinking about uh, about such things for centuries uh, in a different context, but that kind of thinking could be repurposed now when we are talking about these very different types of minds. Perhaps there might be something interesting in the way we've conceived of divine gods, uh, saints, uh, uh, ancestors, uh, demons, and, and and the like, angels also, of course. So uh, so that's why uh, th that game is an afterthought to to my paper because of this constant preoccupation to try to to find things that are relevant there. Uh, but if you are talking to uh, from a very Christian perspective. Is it is it good to create AI in our image or not, uh, or are we doing that? Uh, I think uh, yeah, that's a completely different uh, question. Um, yeah. Uh, so much thanks for your um, very interesting presentation, Marius. Um, uh, we um, the, in our presentation at the end of uh, today, uh, maybe uh, we continue the same uh, approach. Uh, we propose uh, to approach to reach the another um, AI. Maybe we cannot name it AI. Um, um, we, we called it uh, uh, artificial uh, conscious uh, system, for example. Another approach that you said. Um, the, the main uh, one from quantum mechanics and one one from um, biological process that we explained it. Uh, a, a main question uh, I want uh, to know uh, uh, your uh, opinion about uh, that is, uh, it is this new um, uh, future AI that can be reached to, uh, for example, consciousness or, or another um, uh, human cognition aspects. Is, is it defined under human will? Is it defined under the authority of man? There, there, there exists a, a, a conflict of interest between this new um, uh, conscious system uh, and the human existence. M maybe it's under the human authority, such as the um, um, animal or, be or, uh, or beyond the human. Uh, what's your opinion about this uh, situation? Thanks. So if I understand correctly, you're asking whether uh, the uh, whether there will be any conflict because this very different kind of uh, subject will still be under our authority. So we'll be a slave to humans. Is that? Yes, yes. Well, that's the whole point of people who argue for robot rights and uh, the Google engineer who was already advocating for uh, the language model Lambda to, to, to be recognized as a person uh, and uh, not, uh, not, be tested, not be beta tested on uh, anymore. And a lot of sci-fi is, uh, I think, is based on, on uh, is predicated on this premise. Uh, yeah, depending on the moral system that you come from, uh, it might be immoral to, it, it will likely be immoral to, to behave towards these uh, entities as, as, as if they are things, if there is some interiority there, some consciousness as we, we have today. I mean, you, you can find a lot of parallel in, uh, in animal rights discussions. Um, and many people advocate that it would be better to err on the side of caution and just uh, just 
uh, assume that uh, if we don't understand it, if, if it quacks like a duck and smells like a duck and so on, uh, why not think it is a duck? Um, yeah, I don't know about, I think uh, we still do not have a Turing test for consciousness. So of course uh, we keep talking about weak AI and strong AI, but there is no way of knowing. I mean, you, you have this uh, language models today that uh, pass the Turing test perhaps, uh, and still we think, oh, but that's nothing because we know the trick be, be behind the hood. And I wonder to, to which extent we will take this in the future, because uh, if let's say, presumably we have this AI that for whichever purpose, uh, is similar to, to humans in behavior in its output. There is no way of, of discerning what kind of interiority. Uh, you could say, well, we built it, so we know it's not conscious, but how can you know for sure? Because that also, uh, there's a theory there that perhaps some forms of, stru some structures do not lead to consciousness where, uh, while others do. Uh, there's a, a case in point that there is a type of, of uh, of material creature, the human <laughs> body that somehow uh, leads to, to gives birth to, to, to this, but th there's also a philosophical, strong philosophical assumptions behind that claim. So uh, we, I don't think we know. So perhaps it would be better to to just be careful and uh, uh, and uh, err on the side of caution there and not enslave uh, robots if they show signs of human-like uh, behavior. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had a comment about Firebach. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, well, <clears throat> if that were the case, humans in, in AI and computer science are remarkably good at, at uh, finding out what their limitations are. So that, that, that's, you know, he might not have had the benefit of such knowledge, but that's very odd. Uh, Pascal and Leibniz you know they 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 were both uh, Christians and they and they battled to see who could actually have the best general purpose computer and they failed, um, and then there was failure for a long time, and then a guy named Alonzo Church showed up, and he said, "Well, I figured it out," and it was the Lambda Calculus. That's before Turing. That's the first general purpose programmable environment. Uh, and then shortly after that, he said, uh-oh, doesn't work too well. Uh, it can't solve the N. Scheindung's problem, which was the main driver of research in an entire part of mathematics. Um, and what we're doing right now is just taking these machines that fulfill what Pascal and Leibniz wanted, their general purpose finite machines, they are still subject to these limitations, which have grown and grown and grown and grown in what our math has disclosed. So, you know, this is an amazing view <laughs> because unless you think we can get around what a finite machine is, we're, we're basically just, uh, you know, if we put that on a pedestal and say these large language models or any other AI in the future based on a finite computing architecture, those can't be gods. We have all the limitations, but that's us. So we're basically just recreating ourselves and then putting ourselves on some kind of uh, idolatrous pedestal. So I think Church would he's probably, you know, metaphorically turning in his grave. By the way, he was a, a very devout Christian. He's like, yeah, of course this is uh, highly limited. These are just machines. So, you know, I'd like to know more about Feuerbach, but he seems to have a very odd view given the history of formal science. Yeah, Marius, I think I'd like to, to try and bring your paper into conversation with some of the other things that we've talked about in, in some of the presentations earlier. Um, in particular, where we, we previously have talked about infused virtue and theological virtues, and there's no mention of anything like soul spirit uh anything you know sort of theological in the virtues that you you posit and i wonder was that an intentional choice uh and if so what is the the grounding uh of that choice um and then i guess to to maybe do a slightly more pointed question is to maybe say uh, uh hendrawin if if you were to encounter this kind of of ai that marius is is positing would you would you make the argument that this is still uh, 
you know, an artifice of human ingenuity and then therefore completely incapable of, um, you know, of experiencing the kind of grace that, that humans or maybe other living species, depending on, you know, again, going back to sort of animal theology and animal rights sort of uh, conversations, uh, you know, could encounter. So on the question of uh, soul and infused virtues, yeah, I try to stay away from that because uh, uh, I don't know if intentionally, and, and I mean, now, now you're asking the question, I have to confront it. Uh, probably unintentionally, but not completely, I mean, perhaps subconsciously, <laughs> intentionally, uh, because that's a very, um, uh, a very difficult topic to deal with. And uh, I'd rather be agnostic uh, about that. Um, my approach is uh, to try to think whether uh, such a creature, if it developed uh, in a relevant direction, if it be, could it become a, a relevant subject for divine revelation, and could we become of interest for God to uh, to 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 have a sort of relationship with it? Because also looking at the, the evolution of biological life. I think there is a case to be made that uh, uh, God started to interact in a very different way with one of the creatures on, on the planet when that creature became capable of various kinds of things. Uh, I'm not saying that you need to be uh, super intelligent to be in a relationship with God, but there are some, uh, some cognitive abilities that are required, for example, to be part of a covenant. Uh, and Fraser was mentioning the, the importance of also of conceptual thinking, which is uh, nowadays uh, a little bit demonized. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the thing that keeps us away from, uh, from our true nature, which is very instinctual, very uh, implicational, very emotional, effective, uh, embodied. And I, I think there is some truth in that. For example, think of the master and his emissary and the fact that the left hemisphere is perhaps uh, uh, guilty for, for many of the ills of our age. But also uh, conceptual thinking is important in many ways, in virtue, in spirituality, and in other, uh, in other ways. So I think there had to be some evolutionary breakthroughs for life in order to become interest, interesting for God in a different way than just, let's say, uh, the way uh, trees are interesting for God. I'm speculating here. I don't know what God's relationship with trees really is. And trees are uh, obviously more intelligent. We, we, we find out uh, uh, every day uh, new things and uh, actually mind-blowing things about plant intelligence and all other kinds of animal intelligence. But that being said, there is something special, at least in, in the sense we perceive it in the revelation that humans were part of and the infused virtues and, and so on. Uh, and I wonder what the conditions would be for AI to tick those boxes and also become uh, uh, a subject of divine revelation. Um, and uh, I don't want to, to preclude that possibility. Perhaps I'm wrong in that, but uh, I just want to keep it open. Or if it's closed, to be very precise on why it is closed, why people say that uh, AI could never be part of that because, but not not because because there is no uh, mention of AI in the Bible if you want to put it like that or in Revelation. So and Tom Thomas Aquinas hasn't spoken about AI explicitly. So there are no very explicit grounds for excluding it. Therefore, um, yeah, I think there more work needs to be made if if you are to argue that AI will forever uh, just because it's a, an artifact of human. Uh, um, doing uh, will be forever excluded for the kind of thing that we think we are invited to. Yeah, so I think that's my part of the question. And now the part, uh, I think, uh, answer um, and the one, I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, there are two things that I think very important about these issues. The first is about the uh, readiness for any people of any tradition to talk with other tradition in other languages that they use. But the second thing is also about moving beyond anthropomorphic uh, conception of soul and future. And on this regard, I think I agree with Marius that uh, while I said that it's a semblance, it's only a semblance of virtue, it's a semblance of virtue of human. I even open the possibility of the this ingenuity of human is having something akin to sensitive soul, which is, of course, Aquinas never talked, and maybe 
uh, turning in his grave, uh, uh, listening to me saying that. But I think to move, to, to be respectful of tradition, to utilize it to move forward, we need to expand it. And this expansion means we need to speculate beyond what they have said, including even talking about mediated patients, talking about AI future, which is, of course, must be derivative of human because it's constructed by human through human mediated knowledge. But I think there are many spaces for, for talking about uh, it has AI future, which is the perfection of its uh, mediated knowledge and patience, powers. And the second thing, and the first thing about uh, talking with different tradition, people approaching from different tradition, I think, although the working definition of emotion, virtue, of uh, free will is diff are different, we can still talk about the same thing, like what we did just now, to explain, to try to negotiate, to try to find common ground. And I think that's what we do in this conference. Thanks, uh, Eduardo. Uh, the question of whether AI are capable of grace was posed several times this morning, at least over here. Um, but I think that there is a previous question that uh, is, is as important as the first one. Is AI, is AI being capable of sinning? That is, if if it's conceivable of an AI being sinning, then you can go to the second question, whether it's possible to receive revelation and grace and all sorts of gifts from God. That's my opinion. Uh, Hans. Yeah, concerning grace for AI, there's like a general tendency in theology, at least recent, that grace is solely up to God, like who or what gets it, God decides. But it doesn't really matter what kind of properties you have, what kind of being you have. Someone at the Vatican, like in a related discussion concerning aliens and their relationship to God, someone said, well, yeah, aliens can have a relation with God. Why not? Perhaps even better, maybe they haven't sinned. They haven't had original sin. So there really don't seem to be like objections to having other kind of beings, radically different beings, receiving grace from God, it seems. Uh, Hamid? I think one of the most frequent keywords uh, in several presentations is uh, free will. And uh, one of the most important difference is between human and AI, I think, uh, lays in, in this area. Uh, I want to discuss uh, and raise this point about free will that uh, the most, one of the most important feature of free will is indeterminism. And uh, it, in fact, it is indeterministic. And uh, you know, uh, in physics, we say uh, we uh, we in interpret uh, indeterminism uh, as in uh, as unpredictability. You cannot uh, predict uh, which finger I would bend, uh, but because it's in indeterministic feature of free will, but uh, AI is deterministic. The quotes, the everything is deterministic, classical, and and uh, yes, uh, this is the I think the, one of the most important feature uh, that we can uh, concentrate on. If I may just come back on that a little bit, because I I mentioned free will quite a bit in my talk, uh, and. Uh, 
I think if you <laughs> philosophically, I find this very difficult to sometimes wrap my mind around. Like I keep reading the Wikipedia page about the various uh, theories of free will and so on. Um, uh, so that's the level I'm coming from uh, philosophically. But still, I think uh, when you say that humans uh, have this uh, indeterminacy, whereas AI doesn't, maybe you are referring to, to current AI. And even in current AI, I think this, uh, uh, when you're thinking about a deep learning network and you think about all the, um, uh, all the intermediate uh, layers, uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to retrace uh, the exact causality of why, why a certain decision was made. And uh, to a certain extent, I think that resembles, I mean, I, I don't think humans are machines. But uh, I do think that it might be possible for, let's say, from a view outside, uh, like from an Archimedean point of view, uh, or uh, uh, from the divine perspective, to see all the atoms interacting there and to see how that gives rise to certain actions. Whereas for us, that's impossible because of the complexity. So if complexity becomes the issue for both humans and machines, then they are free in the same sense, I would say. Or if you invoke uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty, or if you invoke uh, Godel's incompleteness, or all kinds of things that you might invoke for to, to argue that the human mind is ultimately indeterministic, I guess a complex enough AI would tick that box. So that's uh, what, the, again, I'm, I'm having the benefit of, uh, of engaging with an AI that does not exist, so I can project on it whatever I want, so I can say it will be complex enough whatever that means. So I'm, I'm aware of the vagueness of that. But I just think in principle, it should not be impossible to achieve a similar degree of unpredictability or uncertainty or complexity as uh, a human body and brain. Uh, yeah, I don't know what people think of that, but I would be curious. Uh, Fraser. Um, I'm not happy with the, the claim that humans have free will and machines don't. I'm not happy with it either way around. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of lot of philosophical problems about um, human free will. We, f we feel that we make decisions, but then there's the objection that um, the decisions we feel we're making are actually predictable and determined determined and there's a lot of philosophical discussion about how to square that and different ways of doing so um, and um, what humans feel about what they're doing isn't isn't always a good guide to what's really going on so I think there are problems about the the claim that humans have free will and and the, and the claim that computers don't and can't well um, these are early days in AI and there have been some speculations there I'm sure there are other people who know more about this than I do but I'm thinking of an old book by Phil Johnson Laird on the computer and the mind in one of the late chapters of the book he has some speculations about how you could develop computational modeling of free will um, it's not out of the question so um, this is not I think a sharp and obvious distinction in the way that sometimes claimed. Um, Hamid. Uh, thanks um, uh, I, I must um, add uh, to this um, talk that um, there are many philosophical arguments that uh, um, uh, say you cannot ignore uh, human free will. Um, um, the, some uh, argument and some approach that ignore uh, the free will of human, um, um, all of uh, them uh, fundamentally accept presupposition, pre philosophical supposition that must be proved. Uh, another thing uh, I want uh, said that uh, the answer uh, the um, uh, deterministic uh, uh, of uh, AI because it's computational and um, uh, algorithmic uh, approach of standard AI is very different uh, from the um, undeterministic fundamentally undeterministic the need for free will. Uh, which may be 
uh, we think uh, similar uh, things in quantum mechanics. Uh, so it, it, this fact that we cannot trace uh, the uh, outcoming of uh, AI because of complexity uh, and uh, because this fact that any complex physical system, we cannot predict the external result of that. For example, when you have few particles, you cannot solve this uh, solution on the three particles. But this complexity is classical co complexity. And this, um, uh, 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 and this unpredictability of um, the solution is not the fundamentally indeterministic in the system. We think that uh, the free will uh, also needs causality because the mind uh, must be affect uh, the brain and also it must be fundamentally as quantum mechanic, uh, uh, for example, uh, similar quantum mechanic uh, uh, similar quantum mechanic indeterministic approach, fundamentally must be indeterministic um, related to material um, physical system. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, indeterminism, from the standpoint of the history of, of uh, computation, might might not be the most uh, felicitous term. Uh, indeterministic uh, Turing machines are part of the staple of what students learn when they when they take their first course in computability. Uh, in in indeterminism, there. Uh, what state the machine is going to enter next uh, is determined by absolutely nothing. Now, you can attach probabilities to what's going to happen, and then you get closer to what you see in large language models, you know, conceptually. But that has basically nothing to do with how free will has been characterized by anyone on any side of any fence in, in the Occidental tradition, because there's no agency there. there there's, there's no agent that either seemingly, but does not choose something or decide for something versus otherwise. And in the, in the models of indeterminism computationally, you, 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 have, no, you have no agency. Um, and in the case of a large language model, obviously you have no persisting agency to be found in the architecture. And so you can't find it there the way you can find an executive control in some cognitive architecture. So I don't think it, indeterminism uh, is, is, is the best um, uh, ter term uh, to go with. Uh, Hamid? Uh, thanks. Uh, I just want to emphasize this point that uh, there is difference between uh, indeterministic uh, indeterminism in classical uh, point of view and quantum mechanical point of view and uh, for example uh, butterfly effect is a chaos theory is uh, it it is it may uh, unpredictable uh, effect but it's still it's uh, classical and uh, there's difference between uh, between chance in quantum mechanics in special uh, interpretation, Copenhagen, and chance in classical physics. Uh, I may uh, explain it more in my presentation today. Uh, Hans. Yeah, just to follow up on Professor Brinkser's point, like what seems to be at issue in most popular accounts of free will and philosophy of mind is not in the terminacy or the ability to do otherwise, but control and mindless, which seems to be more like what we should, should focus on to assess whether computers or algorithms can have free will. These things border close to agency indeed. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm finding a lot of this hard to follow as a, as a non-specialist, but very fascinating. Um, uh, we, since we do have a, a second, I do want to see if anybody wants to uh, engage with anything that's been said in the, in the chat. Uh, any of the questions that have maybe been raised from, uh, you know, some of the things that attendees or other uh, panelists have put into the conversation there uh, before we take our break. I see a question from Mark Graves, uh, which I think it was uh, in relation to my uh, uh, talk about empathy. Um, so Mark asks whether uh, he points to <laughs> different a different to, to a significant difference between cognitive and affective empathy so whether you feel it or you just know it, 
you just understand it cognitively and uh, whether cognitive empathy is a good goal or not uh for for the for the ai and uh well that's i think that's a very good question because uh again uh, it depends what what the ai will will do with that kind of understanding so if ai could in theory if if it could understand uh uh our internal states or it could represent them uh in some form um would that be a good thing and i think for many applications of ai it would be a good thing i think commercially that is a sort of a holy grail for for having a kind of uh, ai program that can uh truly understand the, so, so not just uh, the, the stochastic parrots that uh, uh chat gpt is sometimes uh, called to be but an AI that could tr truly understood what what you are going through and could uh, could uh, could answer meaningfully, uh, so so in a sense that's good. Uh, but I can also think about very very uh, problematic uses of that kind of understanding. So I'm not sure I would like artifacts to 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 have uh, a very good understanding of my internal states. Because then uh, that could enable all kinds of uh, manipulation, and uh, again for commercial purposes, perhaps. So, um, so, so, I, I, good in that sense uh, is difficult to define in terms of what. But I think uh, as a user, uh, I would perhaps opt out of that uh, of that thing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for a lively discussion. Um, we will take a fifteen minute break. And we will restart at uh, quarter past the hour. So we'll see you in a few.